Welcome all. So, uh, in the process of learning about the capital structure and its various theories, uh, uh, now I will take you forward with the next important theory which is a landmark in the history of uh, say studying the capital structure of the firms. That theory is uh, uh, called as the uh, say capital structure theory given by the Morgulani and Miller, Franco Morgulani and the Merton Miller. They have given a very, very say after their classical uh, say research, uh, they have come out with a very classical theory of uh, capital structure. So, before as I told you in the previous class also that before this uh, say standard theory or the classical theory of the capital structure given uh, to us by these two Nobel laureates in uh, financial economics. Uh, before that, whatever the approaches we uh, had with us, we we have already discussed those approaches, net income approach, net operating income approach and traditional approach. They all had the different views and uh, we were not able to accept which one is correct and which one to accept. But after this work, which was uh, say first of all uh, say, uh, say presented to the people in 1958 for the first time and later on they revised it and then they changed their own uh, say first proposition and the second proposition of the capital structure theory was given. So, uh, now we are going to discuss that historical work, that historical uh, say model of capital structure and uh, uh, say we are going to conclude logically that uh, how the capital structure of the firms has to be decided. Because earlier we uh, concluded that the uh, say capital structure has uh, uh, no meaning uh, for example, if you talk about the net operating income approach. So, net operating income approach says that the uh, cost of debt and equity does not remain the same right. Say as the, uh, the moment the debt moves into the firm, the cost of equity capital goes up. So, finally, uh, if you talk about the overall uh, capitalization uh, rate or the cost of capital for the firm that remains stable. But the net uh, income approach was uh, contrary to this that was reversed to this and it said that yes that is cheaper than the equity and uh, say uh, if we uh, say infuse more amount of the debt in the firm or in the firm's capital structure then the uh, say uh, overall cost of capital tends to go down. So, these are the two approaches which were scientifically tested by Modigliani and Miller and when they gave their own uh, say uh, standard uh, approach of the capital structure, it also was divided into two parts. First one is the first proposition of the capital structure theory given by the two uh, uh, these novel laureates and the second one was given as a second proposition uh, again by these two people. So, uh, if you talk about the first theory. The first theory is basically uh, uh, almost you can call it as the replica of the net operating income approach. In the net operating income approach also as I just I told you that uh, uh, net operating income approach says that uh, overall cost of equity uh, overall cost of capital remains same because the moment you infuse the amount of debt in the firm the uh, cost of equity capital goes up because the required rate of return is increased by the equity shareholders because of the increased amount of the debt in the firm. Right. So, that is a net operating income approach and Modigliani and Miller uh, hypothesis or this approach also supported the net operating income approach and for that they gave one argument which was called as very famous argument in support of their proposition was arbitrage argument. Right. So, let us discuss what this uh, approach is both the propositions I will discuss with you in detail that is the first proposition of this theory and the second uh, proposition of this Modigliani and Miller theory of the capital structure and then we will conclude that now uh, say is there any uh, say reason or the meaning of the capital structure for the firms or say capital coming uh, maybe from the equity or debt has uh, equal cost and it uh, does not make any sense to increase the amount of debt or the amount of equity and to differentiate between the say overall cost of capital. So, we will conclude it after say, uh, uh, say having the uh, detailed discussion about this theory of the capital structure given by the Modigliani and Miller right. So, uh, before we move into the theory let us uh, say read these very important lines which are given to us by one say another novel laureate in economics that is uh, uh, Robert Merton and Robert Merton has means uh, uh, created a clear cut demarcation a line of demarcation between the say uh, theories before the Modigliani Miller theory and the theory given by the uh, MM that is the Modigliani and Miller. So, he has very nicely very beautifully has said that what was before this theory and what is after this theory 
and how this theory has totally changed the landscape of the capital structure discussion. So, let us uh, see here what Robert Merton has to speak about the say uh, Morgellani Miller uh, theory of the capital structure. He says that Morgellani Miller work stands as the watershed. It stands as the watershed between the old finance and essentially loose connection of the beliefs. It is a loose connection of the beliefs because one approach says that uh, the, the debt makes a difference in the overall cost of capital. Second approach says that the moment the debt comes, the cost of equity capital goes up. So, capital structure has no meaning and traditional approach says something else. So, you can call it as this, this was nicely Mizer remarked as that loose connection of the beliefs based on accounting practices, rule of thumb and NC dots. NC dots means theories or, or sorry the stories or tales. Uh, and and the modern financial economics. The modern financial economics means it is a point of demarcation here. It is a point of demarcation here that Morgellani Miller work stands as the watershed between two uh, between old finance and essentially loose connection of beliefs based on accounting practices, rule of thumb and NC dots and modern financial economics which is given by the uh, these two uh, people Morgellani and Miller. Franco Morgellani and the Merton Miller with its rigorous mathematical theories, with its rigorous mathematical theories and carefully documented empirical studies. So, after very long and uh, say uh, detailed research on the capital structure of the different firms, these two uh, say, uh, say financial experts have proposed this model. So, being a student of financial management, you cannot afford to say not know anything about the MM theory of the capital structure, which is the most scientific and the say systematic theory of the capital structure, which has come up after the uh, long, very long and the detailed research conducted by these two financial experts. So, we are going to learn about that what is this uh, say MM theory of the capital structure and what uh, difference does it make. So, uh, this theory is based upon uh, the two uh, uh, parts means first part is the first proposition of the MM theory, second is the second proposition of the MM theory. In the first proposition the things are totally different, in the second proposition the things are totally different. So, in nutshell you can say in the first proposition Morglani and Miller have supported the net operating income approach and in the second uh, say proposition they have finally supported the net income approach and they have agreed they have accepted it say after the empirical uh, say analysis that yes debt makes a difference that the amount of the debt if uh, means the amount of the debt increases in the capital structure overall cost of capital goes down and uh, say uh, it increases the return to the equity shareholders right. Whereas, in the first case they have said that the cost of the uh, debt and equity is same. So, it means uh, in the first case they were saying that overall cost of capital of the firm remains same and the moment you increase the amount of debt in the firm the cost of equity goes up. So, you are bringing the funds from a source uh, which have the lesser cost of funds whereas, the other uh, source is increasing its cost. So, overall capitalization rate remains the same, overall cost of capital remains same. This is the first proposition and the second one is that when the debt comes in the firm the overall cost of capital goes down and this is the benefit to the equity shareholders. So, in this case let us discuss the first proposition and to understand the first proposition very clearly uh, Morgellani and Miller have taken the say these five important assumptions right. They have taken the five important assumptions their first part of the theory is based upon the five major assumptions and these assumptions are first is the perfect capital market. It means there is a complete uh, say flow of information symmetrical flow of information in the capital market all the managers all the investors know that what is going to happen in the market, what are the different stocks are available, how the market is going to respond, which stock is going to go up, which stock is going to uh, come down. So, perfect capital market situation is, is, is expected by them as the first uh, assumption before proposing this model. Second is rational investors and managers. Managers and investors have the equal amount of information because of the capital market and they whatever the decision with regard to the investment in the say uh, 
stocks of different companies of uh, say uh, maybe of the different uh, nature or different durations they take that is uh, means rationally uh, the decision is taken there is no amount of or element of irrationality among us the investors and managers everybody is equally uh, say uh, rational homogeneous expectations the rate of a return as well as the say cost of capital means is well understood by all in the same way uh, by one and all and then is the equivalent risk classes whatever the different stocks are available in the market they carry the equivalent amount of the risk the amount of the risk is not different with the different kind of the say uh, say uh, sources uh, or make the avenues of investment and absence of taxation there are no taxes right absence of taxation there are no taxes so if you look at these five assumptions they look or they seem to be highly uh, unrealistic because capital market is never perfect second thing is uh, uh, investors and managers all investors and managers cannot be rational homogeneous expectations cannot be right and equivalent risk classes are not expected to be there in the market that all the stocks are carrying the equal amount of the risk and absence of taxation is again another uh, unrealistic assumption but they have taken they have developed this theory this model on the basis of these assumptions and if you uh, say consider these assumptions uh, means uh, uh, carefully uh, then how the model has been proposed how the model has been say given by or the first proposition of the capital structure by the modgliani and miller has given that uh, is uh, we are going to understand here so mm proposition this is a first proposition this is a proposition number 1 this is a first part of the modgliani miller theory of the capital structure and what this first proposition says the value of a firm is equal to its expected operating income the value of its the value of a firm is equal to its expected operating income divided by the discount rate divided by the discount rate appropriate to its risk class higher the amount of risk higher the amount of discount and discount rate and lesser the amount of risk lesser the amount of discount rate and uh, it is independent of capital structure you look at this it is independent of capital structure the value of the firm is independent of the capital structure this is a first proposition given by the modgliani and uh, say miller is the first part of their theory they also supported the net operating income approach and they said that uh, debt has no meaning that you have uh, say capital from the debt or you bring it from the equity the value of the firm is cannot be affected by these sources of the funds it is independent of the capital structure and finally they gave the first part of the model was that is the v is the v is equal to d plus e is equal to o by r so v is basically the market value of the firm d is the market value of the debt e is e is the market value of equity and o is the expected operating income and r is the discount rate applicable to the risk class to which the firm belongs right so it means basically it depends upon the operating income and that operating income to arrive at the present value of the operating income you have to discount it with the say some discount rate and that will depend upon the risk associated to the uh, that particular firm or that particular stock of the firm so uh, finally they have said they have concluded that it is independent of the capital structure it has no meaning means the capital structure has no meaning uh, for the firm and value of the firm doesn't depend upon the capital you cannot means change the value of the firm by having the funds from different sources that one has the lesser cost another has the higher cost so if you increase the amount of the uh, funds uh, which is having the lesser cost so naturally the cost of capital will go down so the rate of return available to the equity shareholders will increase leading to the final say maximization of the value of the firm right so uh, uh, it is clearly written here that it is identical to something which is called as noia that is net operating income approach they have supported the say uh, the net operating income hypothesis or the net operating income approach and in the net operating income approach also if you we go back you will you will find here that what the net operating income approach says net operating income approach says that c the cost of debt is same the cost of overall cost of capital is also same so the this approach says the moment you increase the amount of debt in the let's say total debt equity ratio of the firm the cost of equity capital goes up so finally the ra remains the same finally 
the cost of overall cost of uh, capitalization or overall capitalization rate of the firm remains the same because one is having the lesser cost of capital others cost of capital is increased. So, ultimately your cost of capital overall capitalization rate of the firm remains same. So, this is what it is said here and for that purpose they have given the arbitrage argument also. They have given the arbitrage arbitrage argument also and here uh, what is the arbitrage argument and how they have tried to explain it let us understand it in the say clear meaning or in the clear sense. Uh, what arg arbitrage argument says which is given by these two uh, proponents of this capital structure theory MM theory. First point of the arbitrage argument says in equilibrium identical assets must sell for the same price. In equilibrium when there is a equal amount of the supply of the funds from all the sources from different sources identical assets must sell for the same price irrespective of the fact how they are financed irrespective of the fact how they are financed. For example, you talk about any asset of the firm whether it is financed from the debt or equity it is not going to make any difference at that if it is financed by equity. So, it is going to fetch the lesser price from the market or if it is uh, uh, say financed by the debt it is going to fetch the higher price from the market that is not going to uh, say make the difference. So, it means capital structure means if you think about that you can reduce the cost of capital overall cost of capital of the firm. So, more funds should come from debt or uh, lesser from the equity that is not going to make the difference. No matter how you package a set of cash flows no matter how you package set of cash flows its value remains unchanged its value remains unchanged this is a second argument they have given. And third is the most important argument to support their arbitrage argument is to see how arbitrage mechanism works consider two firms U and L they have we can understand this uh, this argument with the help of uh, uh, an hypothetical case uh, where we are uh, say going to take up now the case of the two firms. Firm U is the unlevered firm and financed by the equity alone financed by the equity alone whereas the firm L is the levered firm and it is financed by financed by a mix of financed by a mix of debt and equity. Right. So, let us create a situation where if you want to understand the arbitrage argument where uh, 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 say these two people say these two financial experts say that debt and equity does not make a difference and for that they have extended the arbitrage argument. So, what is arbitrage argument and how we can well understand it let us uh, means uh, say consider two firms here and these two firms uh, I have put the data of the two hypothetical firms here we have put the firms two firms here one is the firm U and second is the firm L. U means the unlevered firm which is the total capital structure of the firm is financed only through equity no debt is there and it is totally unlevered. Levered means when you talk about the leverage is the debt if you bring any amount of the debt uh, in that capital structure of the firm that is called as the levered firm and if it is free of the uh, say debt in the capital structure then it is called as the unlevered firm. So, uh, sorry if it is I um, will uh, correct it that for example, the say what is the unlevered firm Lever leverage means the debt the amount of debt right leverage means the amount of debt. So, uh, when you talk about the firm U it is the unlevered firm the amount of debt in this firm is 0 the capital structure of this firm is totally financed by the equity and no amount of the debt has been used here in the capital structure of this firm. And even you look at this say, uh, say what is given to us here operating income is EBIT that is earning before interest and taxes 150,000 interest is 0 because no debt is there entire amount has come from the equity. And uh, say you, uh, you see here that is the market value of the equity here is the 10 lakhs 1 million rupees the total investment made in this form is 1 million rupees 10 lakh rupees entire amount has come from the equity. So, no debt is there that is why this form is say as a named as form U it is totally unlevered form whereas this form is named as form L which is a levered firm and in this firm if you look at the say total sources of the funds coming funds coming from. So, number one is the market value of equity is this much and the market value of debt is this much right and market value of the firm as a whole if you talk about this is 1 million and this is 
1.62 million. So, it means these are the two firms and one is only equity finance firm, second one is financed with the equity and debt both. So, now one is unlevered firm, second is the levered firm and now let us means uh, say uh, with the help of this arbitrage argument try to understand what is arbitrage argument and how Morgulani and Miller are going to say uh, prove it that capital structure has no meaning and uh, say whether you finance your uh, total funds requirement you bring in with the help of debt or equity or maybe only equity or only debt it has no meaning and finally the overall say cost of capital to the firm is going to remain the same. So, what is the arbitrage argument they have given with the help of this these two firms we are going to understand that. Now, in this case for example, operating income of the two firms. How much is operating income? 150,000. How much is operating income? 150,000. Same operating income of both the firms is 150, 150. Whereas, the market value of the firm which is unlevered firm only financed with the help of equity is 1 million. Whereas, the market value of the firm is more than this firm by 62,500 rupees whereas, the operating income is same. So, the market value of the two firms is different, but the operating income is the same right. And if you talk about the equity earnings, the equity earnings are here 150,000 because total what is the cost of equity here market value of equity is 1 million cost of equity is 15 percent. So, equity earnings are 150,000 entire amount will go to the equity shareholders whereas, in this case because debt and equity have come in the different proportions. So, only one part of the income will go to the equity because the one first part will go to the say the, the suppliers of debt or to the lenders. So, it means because the market value of the debt is 50,000 and the cost of debt is 12 percent. So, it means after settling the claims or servicing the debt component which is 5 lakh into 12 percent is 60,000 rupees. So, out of 150,000 rupees operating income 60,000 will be going as a interest component here and only the equity earnings will be 90 percent. So, this is the whole case if you look at that unlevered firm and the levered firm operating income of both the firms is same, the, but the market value of the two firms is different. The market value of the unlevered firm only financed by the equity is 1 million, whereas the market value of this firm is 10,62,500. So, in a way you can interpret it that the market value when the market value of the two firms is different, but the operating income is same, but the operating income is same. So, in this situation what is going to happen and how the arbitrage argument is going to work right, how the arbitrage argument is going to work. So, in this case what is going to happen that this situation cannot persist as per the arbitrage argument when the say market value of the two firms is different and the operating income is same this situation cannot sustain in the market, this situa situa situation cannot say persist in the market, this situation is not permissible, this is going to change. How this situation is going to change? Because in this form normally what happens that say uh, when you talk about the uh, uh, say uh, the firm which is having the higher value, the firm which is having the higher value uh, there because we always assume that the scope for the further growth of the firm is not there in the market. So, what the investors do sometime what the investors do that say who are the short term investors in the market they, they say that now this is the maximum growth of the firm and uh, this firm is not further going to grow uh, in the market. So, let us sell our stake whatever the earning we had to do in this firm let us sell our stake in this firm and say part of the stake we can invest into the firms which are say still have the scope to grow in the market. So, if you look at this uh, these two firms market value of this firm has already reached to 10,62,500 whereas, the market value of this firm is lesser. So, this firm is having the lesser market value as compared to this firm. So, it means there is a possibility that the unlevered firm may further grow up in the market. So, if you buy the stock of the unlevered firm today and further it grows over a period of time. So, it will be the net gain to the equity shareholders. So, it may be possible because and the market value of the two firms is different either the market value of all the firms has to be same then the arbitrage argument is, is, is not going to work, but if the market value of the two firms is, is, is different. So, what is happening? 
the investors having the higher market value, the firms having the higher market value, they will sell the stocks of those firms to earn the say, uh, say differential amount in the terms of the profit or that return on investment and then they can invest into the say, uh, say uh, the, the firms having a lesser market value and finally, they uh, expect that the firms which are having the lesser market value they will also grow and normally it happens in the market also that you do not tend to buy the stocks of those companies whose market value is already very high because the growth rate is already has been attained and further possibility of the growth is not there. We try to buy the stocks of those companies whose stocks are at the, at the lesser price and we expect that they will also grow over a period of time and at least reach up to a level where the other firms in the industry are there in the market. So, if you buy at a lesser price and the stock grows over a period of time, so at that time when it grows up and you sell that stock in the market, you earn the better returns. right? So, for example, same thing will happen in this case because the firm which is having the higher value, the stock of this may be sold in the market by the investors and the firm having the lesser value, the stock of this firm will be purchased uh, and over a period of time means expected that the stock of the firm U will also grow in the market. But what is the arbitrage argument? Now, what happens that when the people will start selling the stock of the firm L which is having the larger or the higher market value, the stock price of this firm will start falling and the stock price of the firm will start going up because the demand for the stock of the firm U is now increasing. So, the uh, price of the stock of the firm whose demand is increasing the market start going up and the price of the stock of the firm whose stock is being sold in the market, whose supply is increasing in the market will fall down. So, what will happen? Today the value of L is higher, so people are selling L and buying U. Right? Tomorrow what will happen? That the price of U will go up, so people will start selling U and start buying L. So, this process will continue unendingly and that is, is not possible. That is not possible uh, because this is arbitrage. This process is called as the process of arbitrage and this process will, will continue. So, we have to stop this process somewhere. If you want to stop this process somewhere, so means we have to create a situation where the market value of all the firms is equal. So, ultimately the market value as per the first proposition of the MM uh, model, the market value of all the firms remains the same, it remains unaffected. Otherwise, arbitrage will start taking place, will happen in the market and if arbitrage continues in the market, so it means means uh, there will be no stability in the overall uh, say, uh, say capitalization process of the firms. So, now how this process will work, how the arbitrage will work and how the things will say keep on moving in the markets, I will discuss with you uh, means uh, further uh, taking this uh, discussion on. So, how we can uh, do it? For example, there is an investor who has a 10 percent stake, 10 percent stake in firm, in firm L, right? He will sell his stake in the his 10 percent stake in the firm L and what is his uh, total value of that stake in the firm L uh, say uh, what is the total um, equity value in the firm L. The equity value of the firm L is market value of the equity is this much right. So, if any investor who is having a stake of 10 percent in this firm L if he sells his stake. 10 percent stake which he has if he sells the entire stake in the market how much amount he will get? He will get the total amount is number 1, he will get the total amount of rupees how much 56,250 uh, right, he will get this amount. And now in the second case because now he want to sell the stake in firm L and want to buy the stake in firm U to earn say a differential amount of the profit. So, what he will do? He will borrow, he will borrow uh, another amount of say I would call it as 50,000 from the market, he will borrow rupees 50,000 from the market, how much that is equivalent to the 10 percent of this total debt in this firm uh, say uh, L and what is the cost of borrowing 12 percent. So, he will borrow 50 another 50,000 at the rate of 12 percent. So, total amount which is available with him is how much that is going to be 1 lakh 6,250. This amount is going to be 1,6250 and out of this number 3 he will buy the stake how much 
10 percent stake and 10 percent stake of this firm is how much is the total market value of the firm? It is 1 million rupees 10 lakh and he will buy 10 percent of this and he will shell out how much? He will shell out that 1 lakh rupees here and uh, still the difference how much amount is still available with him? 6250 is still available with him, right. So, he has 10 percent stake in the firm L which is sold in the market and he borrowed another 50,000 at the same rate of interest which is the firm L, L is paying in the market. So, what he is doing? This 10 percent borrowing 50,000 is equal to the 10 percent of the total debt in the firm L. So, what he is doing? He is replacing the corporate debt in firm L with his personal debt and by raising the total amount of how, how much? 100, uh, 1 lakh 6,250 uh, rupees he is buying the 10 percent stake same amount of the stake in the firm U and if he buys that. So, he has to shell out only how much? He has to shell out only 1 lakh rupees and remaining 6,250 he can invest somewhere else in the market. So, if he does the, this, this kind of thing what is going to happen? Ultimately his overall income is not going to be say get affected his overall income is going to remain the same right. So, because earlier he has the total investment in the firm uh, say uh, again 10 percent right. Now, he is also having the investment in the firm equal to the 10 percent of the equity but of the firm U, but his income is going to remain the same. So, earlier he has to almost invested how much? 1,6250 by investing the same amount because corporate debt it belongs to him as well because he is the owner of the firm and tomorrow if there is a say problem any kind of the financial problem then out of his equity stake that debt will be uh, paid back uh, uh, to the lenders. So, it means he, uh, he is responsible for the corporate debt. So, in a way you can say earlier he had invested 1,6250 in the firm where the 56,250 was in equity and he has the share of the debt equivalent to 10 percent of 50,000. So, total income of the uh, total uh, say investment his investment in the firm was 1,6250. Now, by investing the same amount uh, say uh, investing the lesser amount by 6,250 by investing just 1 lakh rupees he can get the same amount of income in the firm or from the firm L. So, ultimately he is still left with the surplus amount of the 6250 and this amount if he invests somewhere else his income will be more than what he is getting uh, from the from his investment in the firm L. So, how it will work? Let us see it that uh, how it is going to be th this. So, we will call it as the say uh, for example, old income. This is the old income of the person this is the new income, this is the new income. So, where old income was when he was in firm L and now he is in the firm U right. So, in this case 10 percent of uh, firm's equity income, 10 percent of firm's equity income, 10 percent of firm's equity income is uh, equity income is how much? 10 percent of firm's equity income in the old form. If you talk about the old form, it is 90,000 rupees which is a equity earning and 10 percent of it because ultimately he has a 10 percent stake. So, this income is going to be 9,000 here and whereas in this form now the new income is going to be how much? 150,000 he has bought the stake of 10 percent. So, his income is going to be how much? His income is going to be now 50,000 uh, 15,000 rupees right. In this case less less uh, 12 percent interest, 12 percent interest on borrowings, 12 percent interest on the borrowings, he is not going to pay any interest here, whereas he is going to pay the how much he is borrowing from the market? 50,000 rupees. So, how much interest he is going to pay? 6,000 rupees. So, we are subtracting this. Finally, the total income in both the cases, total income here is 9000 total income here is 9000. So, it means in this case in the new income is means 15000 plus uh, means uh, in this income 15000 less he has to 
pay the see, interest cost also because he has only invested from his pocket half of the investment half he has borrowed from the market. So, it means in this case his total income has gone up from the 9000 to 15000 and he has borrowed he has replaced the corporate debt with the personal debt. So, he is going to pay the interest cost of 6000 rupees. So, it means 9000 is going to be his residual income whereas, his income in the old investment was 9000. So, what is happening the difference here is income level is going to remain the same whereas, the investment level is different the investment level here is 106,250 which was the old investment level 56,250 was the investment in equity and 50,000 stake he had in the debt of the firm whereas, the new investment is here only 1 lakh rupees. So, by investing lesser amount by 6250, he uh, see is ending up having the same amount of the income. So, he has left over with the say some balance of the 6250 and this he can invest in the market. So, his overall income will be the new income plus the income for this investment and whatever the income for example, if he earns even 200 rupees. So, this income will become uh, 9200 rupees whereas, this income is only 9000 rupees. So, it means this uh, arbitrage will continue this arbitrage will continue to happen until and unless the market value of both the firms remain the same. Because what we are seeing here if you look at the two firm situation operating income is same, but the market value of the two firms is different or other way around you can say the market value of the two firms is different, but the operating income is the same. So, what is happening that the firm which is having the higher market value the people will start selling their stake in that firm and start buying the stake of the firm whose market value is lesser in the expectation that the market value of this firm will also go up as the market value of this firm is, is already very high. So, market value of this firm will also increase. So, they will earn the increased income over a period of time. So, in this process what will happen? In this process we look at now say we were, we were here that uh, we, we started talking about the firms and now we will say the value of the levered firm is higher than the unlevered firm even though both the firms have the same operating income and belong to the same risk class. This is what I was just talking to you value of the levered firm is higher than the unlevered firm even though both firms have same operating income and belong to the same risk class. Same such a situation cannot persist because equity investor would do well to sell their equity in firm L which I just explained it to you that they will sell the equity in the firm L because that is the having the more value. So, they will be able to fetch the higher price from the market by selling their stock in the market and invest in the firm U which is less valued firm. So, in the anticipation of increasing the value of the firm U also they will sell it in the say highly valued firm and then they will invest into the lesser valued firm uh, with, with the personal leverage which I told that they will borrow some amount and 50,000 they will borrow from the say market. So, earlier their investment was 1,6250, 56,250 was in equity and his responsibility towards the corporate debt was equivalent to 10 percent which is 50,000. So, in a way total investment becomes 1,6250 whereas, in the new investment now he has got 56,250 by selling the stake in the levered firm. 50,000 he borrows from the market at the rate of the same rate of interest which the firm L is paying in the market. So, total amount of the funds now available with him is 1,6250. So, he is now investing only 1 lakh setting aside 6250 whereas, investing 1,6250 and investing 1 lakh in the unlevered firm his net income is same that is 9000 what we have seen earlier and plus he has 6250 rupees plus surplus left with him if he invest that also in the market he will get some additional income. So, what will happen arbitrage says people will keep on selling in the firms which are more valued and will keep on investing in the firm which are valued as less in the anticipation that the say valuation or the value of the lesser valued firm will also go up and the say their stock price will also increase. So, the moment the value of the lesser valued firm increases they will sell the stock and they will make the 
differential profit and again buy the stock of the firm which is less valued. So, this process will continue and this all is happening because of the say in the levered firm we had the funds from the two sources and in the unlevered form we had the funds from the one source. So, the, if, the, if you accept the argument, Morgulani Miller said if you accept the argument debt is cheaper and it increases the cost of capital and increases the value of the firm as it has happened in this case. So, what will happen? The people will sell the stock in this firm, they will buy the stock in this firm, later on they will sell the stock in this firm, they will buy the stock of this firm and this process will continue. So, people will keep on making profit just because of the arbitrage. Arbitrage means selling the stock in the highly valued firm and buying the stock in the lesser valued firm. Then later on after increasing the value of the lesser say a valued firm selling the stock in the more valued firm and again buying the stock of the lesser valued firm. So, this process will continue in the market and the market will never stabilize. So, it means if you bring the sources uh, means the funds from the different sources you cannot have the equal value for the say the firms having the same asset class and the same level of the risk which is not expected to happen in the market which is not acceptable argument. So, in this case finally, what they have said is in the say support of their arg arbitrage argument note that his risk exposure remains the same right as we have seen both the firms are having the equal risk class L and U level of risk is same in both the firms because he has merely replaced 50,000 of his personal borrowings for his share of firm L's corporate borrowing, his share of firm L's corporate borrowings or he has substituted homemade leverage, he has substituted homemade, homemade leverage for the corporate leverage, for the corporate leverage. Second, when investors sell their equity in firm L, when the investors sell their equity in the firm L and buy the equity in the firm U which I am just mis, uh, I was telling you the market value of the two firms tend to change. The market value of the two firms will tend to change. The firm where people are selling the stock the market value will come down and the people the firm people are buying the stocks market value will go up. So, this process will continue. This process will continue until the market value of both the firms become equal until the market value of both the firms become equal because only then possibility of earning a higher income, possibility of earning a higher income for a given level of investment and leverage by arbitrage is eliminated. Arbitrage otherwise is also not supported in the market, it is not a good thing that just for the artificial change in the price you keep on buying and selling the stocks in the market and if you say that capital structure makes a difference then arbitrage will be supported whereas on the other side we are not in the position to support the arbitrage, we do not consider the arbitrage as a good thing. So, it means when you want to condemn the arbitrage. But if you say that the capital structure makes the value of the firm difference uh, different, so naturally the arbitrage is going to be encouraged right and as a result the cost of capital of both the firms become the same right. So, it means what is happening uh, say for a given level of the investment and leverage by the arbitrage is eliminated until and unless the arbitrage is eliminated. So, people will keep on making the higher incomes simply means there is no increase in the overall value of the firm practically, but just by arbitrage people are making money in the market which is not a good thing. So, as a result the cost of capital of both the firms becomes the same right. So, it means if you want to stop the arbitrage what you have to do is you have to make the cost of capital both the firms the same and if the cost of capital of both the firms is same. So, what will happen final value of the firm will also become the same and if the value of the firm becomes the same arbitrage will not happen and we want to condemn the arbitrage we do not want to support the arbitrage. So, because of that reason you cannot say that the market value of the two firms will be different. If you say Morgulani Miller have said in their first proposition if people say that debt is cheaper than the equity and if we have the more amount of debt lesser amount of equity or the debt, debt equity ratio of 1 is to 1 as compared to the debt equity ratio of the 0 is to 1. So, it means the firm having the debt equity ratio of 1 is to 1 as compared to the firm having a debt equity ratio of the 0 is to 1 will be 
having the lesser cost of capital overall, lesser cost of capital and the market value of the firm will increase. So, what will happen? If there are two firms in the market, one is totally equity financed, another is financed with the mix of the debt and equity. So, it means as per the say argument of the debt and equity having the different cost, the market value of the firm which is having the debt equity ratio of 1 is to 1 will be more because their overall cost of capital will be less. Right. So, when the market value of the firm will be more, people having the equity stake in the firm having the higher market value will start selling and start investing into the firms having the lesser market value in the anticipation that the market value of the firm having no debt at all in their capital structure will also go up and they will then sell the stock in the in the firm which is only equity financed over a say period of time then the value will go up they will sell the stock or the, their stake in the firm U and will invest in the firm L. So, it means what will happen in that situation the in these two firms what will happen arbitrage will continue happening because if you are selling in the firm L buying firm U. So, the price of the stock will go down in the firm L. So, this cap, overall say capitalization market value of the firm will go down firm L will go down and the market value of the firm will go up. Later on we will start selling in the firm U. So, market value of the firm will U will go down and the market value of the firm will go up. So, this all is arbitrage and this is not supported this cannot be means allowed to happen in the market for long. So, we have to create a situation ultimately where the cost of capital of both the firms is same market value of both the firms is same. So, that arbitrage does not happen and if that is the situation expected to happen in the market then where is the difference in the cost of capital of the different sources of the funds. All the sources of the funds are means at the at the same cost of the capital and if the all the sources of the capital are coming with the same cost or they are having the equal amount of the cost then how can you say the capital structure makes a difference. How can you say the capital structure makes a difference? Capital structure does not make a difference, capital structure has no meaning. So, this was the first argument, this was the first proposition of the Modigliani and Miller. But later on when they came out with the second argument, when they considered some important say changes in their assumptions and the major change in their assumptions which they uh, affected was the taxes and they accepted that because of the taxes say affecting the debt cost or the cost of the debt overall cost of the debt goes down and the cost of equity automatically increases the cost uh, the required rate of return automatically increases. So, it means if you want to increase the market value of the firm for the equity shareholders then certainly the capital structure makes a difference. So, in that case more amount should come from the debt and lesser from the equity. So, that debt being the tax deductible uh, will increase means they reduce the overall cost of the capital for the firm and when the overall cost of the capital will go down automatically the market value will increase and after say, say servicing the debt borrowed from the market the ultimate value of the firm for the equity shareholders will be high. So, what is the second proposition of the Modigliani and Miller and how they have means uh, proved it that yes capital structure makes a difference and different sources of the funds have the different cost and they can impact the say value of the firm I will discuss with you in the next class. Till then thank you very much.